I have to say that even I was under the impression, despite everything I've seen of him, that Vosh, or Ian, might have at least understood some general basics about racism. After piling through three hours of his debate with Professor Flowers, that turned out to be wrong. I mean, how can a person be an oppressor because of their race? Did all the millions of white people in South Africa, like, individually oppress all the black people there? And I can tell you from my experiences online, there are a lot of black people who are pretty goddamn racist. I think it's kind of silly to pretend that there aren't black people who just are kind of shitty to white people in a way that doesn't have a sort of institutional bias behind it. There is nothing about being white that inherently makes you more racist. Over here in America, there are a lot of black people that are racist against white people. It's not like one tribe ruled America. The tribes that ruled the Americas before we came no. here there's conquered a bunch of other tribes, tribes yeah, a bunch beforehand. Of people. So does the America belong to the tribe that owned it last or the first tribes that we can ever anthropologically determine control the territory? Lua has already done her own response. I'm not going to pretend that I know everything or speak for her, but I had some time on my hands and this debate really annoyed me. So I just wanted to try and talk about a few things. What can I say? I'm an unpredictable man. The reaction that Ian and his fans exhibited when faced with the general assertion that it's not your right to dictate the terms of decolonization to the colonized is actually not too unfamiliar to me, because it reminds me of, well, me. When I was a young leftist, I felt particularly uncomfortable by this man. Because if you know, Malcolm X didn't take his fools gladly. He didn't give a shit and he took no prisoners, because fundamentally, he wanted autonomy for his own people, and he didn't want that to be dictated by whites. His manner and content of speaking always made me, as a white dude, feel a bit, yeah, you know, I don't know, he says such hostile stuff, you know, he doesn't care about white people, you know, this doesn't work, we gotta work together. Yet, as time went on, I started connecting some of the stuff that he said to the stuff that I see in real life. And I started to understand a little bit better the mindset of minorities. I started listening to more of his work and other people's like Franz Fanon and James Baldwin. And eventually my opinion on Malcolm X turned from a cowering eee to one of... Hmm, is what it is, right on. Because I understood, I guess, my place in the world. I understood, yeah, I've got it pretty well off, to be honest, and I got that when it comes to your sense of self, all of the pedantic consistencies never really matter much in the long term. What you want first and foremost is to exist as a human being. I think people got this same anxious, almost offended feeling when No Name said that she didn't want Whitey following her on Twitter anymore. Ah, no, no name, you gotta work together, no name. Uh, whoa, 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 woke segregation, ah, Fred Hampton. Yes, because acclaimed black communist rapper No Name has totally never heard of Fred Hampton. Take a hint. It is this very milk toast, baby's first political education mindset that appears to be very common these days, especially amongst white American lefties, but is also across the pond as well who seem to think that it can all just be solved by what I can only describe as vague gesturing. Let's all work together. And that's not how it works. You can't just claim, yeah, integration, and then by some magic formula, we all just get along. I remember a certain black communist state his absolute disdain for when white pinkos come into black spaces during and after actions and hand out flyers for their org under the banner of yeah, let's unite, but then are never ever seen again. Do you understand that that doesn't really seem to fit, right? There's something very performative about it. It's very much unite, but on our terms. Hence why many socialist people of colour prefer the company of other people like them even if their views don't exactly line up, than with white socialists. And it only really takes a quick look at Ian's repertoire to see why that might be. So I'm gonna go a little bit hard on her. I don't give a fuck if you don't like being around white people. He's got this incredibly juvenile, gamer bro, populist understanding of race, amongst many other things, that appears to give off a progressive tone, but in reality it just feels mute and hollow not to mention egoistic. It's not a reactionary perspective to want to not talk to white leftists. It's you 
being arrogant and starting with the position that I am right, everybody come to me. Oh, they're not coming to me? Well then in that case, they must be reactionary. But of course it's not just Ian, it's systemic. And I think part of this comes down to the way we're often taught about topics like nationalism in school and the media, by just simply showing the white boogeyman and not understanding it as a very serious thing that has a lot of complexities and duality to it. If you watch Flower's video, she explains there that there were once various people groups across the contiguous United States who are now just known under the simple moniker of Native American or American Indian. That's because of history. History, power dynamics, and minoritization. These forces created a shared struggle amongst those people, a shared experience, if you will, that coalesced these groups as a nation. Importantly, they still exist. They still exist there, and most importantly, there's somebody else there who isn't part of that group for a plethora of reasons. Ask yourself the reason why we call people who live in Britain British, rather than, say, Britonic. It's because the Britonic tribes physically don't exist as a concept anymore. They've been absorbed into the dustbin of history through conquests, miscegenation, and the lack of a dominant power to contrast with. It doesn't justify any such horrific acts of history, but it's simply a fact. They are now gone as a people, and they can't really be reconciled. You attempt to try and revive an ancient culture as your identity. You can try. Even if you trace your ancestry back over 2,000 years, it doesn't work. Because there isn't an equivalent dynamic involved. So you end up looking like a weirdo, and not the oppressed. Self-appointed druids are not under attack in this country. That's what it's all about. Who's being affected now? Not some stupid Red Ice media level discussion on who owned it last. So when these groups form as a nation, their inherent experience, in contrast to the other, takes on a fundamentally different character. Let me ask you another question. Name me a white nationalism? or an English nationalism, or a French, Aussie, German, American nationalism that fundamentally cements its beliefs as left-leaning. You can't. That's because the inherent nature of majority powerful nations leans itself towards vulgar characteristics. Like spoiled toddlers getting their toys taken away, they lash out at the slightest glimpse of fairness. You go to a country like Ireland, however, a former colony, and notice how the nature of Irish nationalism, or republicanism, historically carried with it a very different standing to that of its neighbour. Go even further down the rung, there are even more pressing issues that need solving, and thus the nature of these groups fold themselves towards solving those present injustices. Whether a group actually calls itself a nationalism or not, it doesn't take away the very material reality that emerges when one is of a shared culture, history, or language. If you're a white American, you can watch all manner of American media and get that funny feeling inside. That same feeling cannot always be said for others. It comes as a great shock to discover that when Gary Cooper was killing off the Indians, and you were rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians were you. You live in a country in which the dominant hegemony represents and glorifies people like you. And whether you disagree with that hegemony or not, just saying that doesn't matter, you're still influenced by it. That's why the calls of people to say, oh, it's nothing doesn't really matter because you still have a home to go back to, you still have a nation by which you can rest on. In summary, status quo nationalism almost always bends to the right, but in oppressed ones, you get a mix. I will say though that even a vulgar trend from an oppressed nationalism is not and never the same as its polar opposite. Take a very known example. The Nation of Islam is of course well known for its highly homophobic, sexist and frankly weird views. I bet even Ian might label them as racist towards whites. <laughs> but in their position as an oppressed group, they are still in the mission of helping black self-determination be that in prisons, drug rehab, and housing and employment projects. Those are all things that speak to the people they're talking to, and just as a matter of fact, they often do it a lot better than many communist groups in the United States. So, yeah, think about that. So that is a very easy way of understanding why there is a difference between black and white nationalism. 
and how the common reduction of it into a vile mass of in-group and out-group dynamics just doesn't hold up. Because there are very genuine claims made by one group that simply doesn't compare to the other. It's not all relative like some seem to think it is. Such claims are decidedly liberal. Wait, hold on, no they're not. Gay people in Saudi Arabia are just a product of Western degeneracy that feeds in through global media. Um, in reality, it's actually a, a product of white international um, uh, uh, cultural bias that is infesting the people in Saudi Arabia. So given that, given they're basically a symptom of Western degeneracy, do you think they not have a right to address that in whatever way they think is most culturally effective? The great thing about reality is that you can wheedle out the difference between truths and untruths. Look at the what, historical what you're record saying, and determine who's colonized what or you're not. Saying, like people are going to say stuff and then there's history. There's things that actually happen. It isn't to say that all of this exists in infinity. When times change, well, so do the dynamics. If it goes past its necessity, then it will become vulgar and dogmatic. But like I said, we live in a world made up of nations. And until that physically goes away, Anything else is, again, just vague gesturing. So, in a situation such as Israel-Palestine, we can now better understand the dynamics involved in the stakes they play. Palestinians, which, remember, doesn't exclude indigenous Jews and other men and minorities, are, as of current, the indigenous group of today. Not because they lived there for a while, but because of a shared experience through contrast to a dominant group. Just like the Maori are indigenous to New Zealand, even though they only arrived some 300 years before the Europeans did. Jewish people, of course, still have the right to self-determination. They still exist today as a minoritized group. What that does not suddenly grant them, however, is rule over a land because their people happened to live there some time ago. There wasn't an apartheid-esque situation until the lines were drawn by the settlers. And arguably, you could also point to many other lands that also hold Jewish claim. Most notably, Iberia, which flourished prior to the Inquisition. Somehow, I don't think this logic would suddenly pan out for any other group, would it? Drawing lines in the sand to a country that you don't live in, to which there is no colonial dynamic involved, is hardly a decolonial project, is it? Come on. And if you want to read a little bit more about this on the very unique nature of modern-day Zionism, then I would recommend Ilan Pape's book Ten Myths About Israel. So this is why the cries of ethno state that has basically become a red scare amongst many leftists simply doesn't compute. Literally every country that deposed its former colonizers just became another state. Haiti. Jamaica, Kenya, Algeria, Tanzania, DRC, Sudan, Egypt, Zambia, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Ireland. As far as I know, there is no ethnic validation necessary to go and live in these places, believe me. The only country of any that represents that today is Israel. Now, I've just been speaking about this for 10 minutes or so, so just to hammer home this point a little bit more, after all of that, after all of the nuance that I've described involved in this discussion, this is what Ian is interested in. Do you think it's possible for a white person to live ethically in South Africa? Do you think the black people, who are by far the majority, have a right to remove the white population? What if a person who's black in a black ethnostate falls in love with a white person? Can they raise mixed children in a black ethnostate? What if people thought within a country that the only way for them to escape colonialism was through the wholesale slaughter of the white people who live there? If the third world decided they could do that, but it probably wouldn't work. The only way to truly succeed would be global conquest through military or nuclear arms. Do you think that would be defensible as a sort of final way of eliminating the colonization? You'll notice during this video that I haven't focused much on it. That's because it's clearly opportunistic. I figured that this debate would be addressing some of Ian's more milk toast attitudes that Flower brought up in her videos. But instead, Ian is deliberately extrapolating to stupid hypotheticals that have little to no historical basis as a way to disprove the very obvious difference laden in oppressed nationalisms. Obviously, Ian knew that he was going to be pushed on his bad opinions, so it would make sense to instead counter with what is a very mute point. It's not like his fans wouldn't just move on from his response to something in a heartbeat, despite stating numerous times that she's not pro-genocide, 
Lua doesn't get that same treatment. He does this a lot, if you'll notice, most memorably justifying pedophilia as consistent with buying computer products because he didn't want to lose to the vegans. Because we, we buy shit all the time that's made the silicon farmed by slaves in Africa, plastic made in like, you know, factory farms that pollute the earth, like that sort of thing. But we don't impugn each other for it. Um, okay, so if you were to, so, you know, there's pedophiles, right, who buy child pornography. Mm -hmm. Would you say they should not be held responsible for doing that? Yes. Really? Even though mm -hmm. they're directly supporting child rape? Yeah. I think that's it's uh, it's hypocritical. <laughs> you can do this extrapolation in any kind of way. My culture is very important to me as an oppressed minority. Oh, so what if your culture supports child brides, huh? Then that's suddenly okay? Hmm? Hmm? Ever thought of that? Obviously we wouldn't support that. Like I've said, there are plenty of reactionary practices in any culture. But... C c can we just, like, try and engage in discussion for a second? Does that suddenly mean that the whole concept of culture being very integral to oppressed groups, in light of the appropriation and demonization by the majority, is now somehow dismissed and <laughs> proved wrong because Irish laddie just threw in something straight out of left field? It really takes me back five or six years to when anti-feminists thought that they could debunk decades of research on social conflict theory in just a single video. And it really reeks of this no black rights, no gay rights, no women's rights, just human rights. It's liberal bile. And it is completely devoid of any nuance whatsoever. Uh, fuck, wait, black fuck black I don't give a fuck about preserving culture. Yeah, well maybe you should. I know that statement might make you sound very ethereal, pretty funky and out there, right? Well, to me, you sound like an edgy YouTube atheist. <sighs> have we entered a leftist dark age recently? Why have so many people suddenly adopted such a reductive idea of very complex issues? This is what happens when you put winning and semantics over trying to engage in a discussion. Does that remind you of anything? <laughs> I would like to briefly touch on this comic because it's a great example of how quickly something can go from being a very useful critique into an unnecessary dogma. On its own, the comic is good. It's explaining how obtuse it is to not think about the greater dynamics in society and instead just use the superficial points at hand to declare victory. But over time, this comics use has gone from getting people to think into this is what you should think and this is how you should respond. So streamers earning large amounts of money and fame might be counterproductive to the overall struggle. The comic. I've seen this sentiment on far too many occasions and I always find it really depressing. Do you see how all the nuance is now gone? All talk of thinking about how our financials and fame might affect our decision making. No, it's not worth talking about because Matt Boar's comic. Don't bother engaging, Matt Boar's comic. Don't bother analysing, Matt Boar's comic. And as a final remark to all these genocide support accusations, since I'm sure Ian's fans love to talk about logic, well, here's some for you. Not saying yes or no doesn't mean that you therefore support the opposite. Simply that the answer is not yes or no. Libertarians love to posit the self-ownership principle, that if you don't own your body, that therefore means that somebody else does. But in reality, the answer is much more simple. Nobody does. People are missing the point when it comes to the statement that the colonized do not have to live with their colonizers. It's not to say which is right and which is wrong, Simply that colonialism digs its own gravediggers, and said gravediggers are not to blame for that. Colonialism is a fucked up issue, drawn out with horrendous baggage and trauma that doesn't always leave the most desirable of options in the minds of the colonised. And yet, despite all of this, I highly doubt that if Ireland were to become peak Ireland that you would suddenly have 
Catholics and Southerners going down to hunt all the Brits and Prods from Ulster, would you? Somehow, I doubt that's going to happen. I wonder why. And rather than me having to do all your homework for you, you might want to find out the answer for that question yourself. People like Ian will always try and claim that they are only being objective. Well, to the native, objectivity is always against him. And I take those words with you, if I were you, even if for the sake of arguments, Professor Flower's point here was a little bit flawed. Why exactly would you therefore take the views of Ian like some sort of sacred testament, as most of his fans evidently appear to do? When someone makes remarks like this... I mean, you can argue logistics on this. No part of America is going to be given over to black people. If you move to Africa, where no country is better in total than America is in terms of socioeconomic achievement, probably not. I don't know. Are black people in Africa safe? It seems like they're not, because they die more than black people do over here. But your economy is going to be buckled under the knee of America. I was just wondering how you felt about black people who are racist against white people. This is also what modern Nazis say about Jews in America. It's literally trying to have your own self-determination. That's what it That's is. That's what the white nationalists what ask for. Right there. Self-determination is the dog whistle that they use when talking about ethnostates. Does none of that language give off awfully familiar vibes? Does none of that mindset not raise an eyebrow? Does it not scream of a certain first world-centric thinking? Does it not, for that matter, seem incredibly simplistic and juvenile? The lack of any response from people who take in these words tells me quite a lot about the nature of the people that we're dealing with. This is the problem with the baby leftist mindset. It is a highly smug and self-satisfied understanding of the world that is hostile to any critical analysis of its own chauvinist characteristics, because to do so, by its very presence, would wreck it. And if that happens, then that is a very grave moment for Vosch. The most wretched of this whole thing, though, is the fact that even if Ian decided, by some divine encounter, to go back on all of his words, and change his mind, and reassess his positions, he still wins. Ian's audience would adapt and soon follow his party line. How ironic. Feeling validated because their lord and master has now given them the green light. And yet, all of those who made him change his mind in the first place would be cast into general obscurity, whilst Ian grew ever more popular. Hell, even his fans might use this change as a way to say, See, haters, he did change his mind. See, are you going to be happy now? Recuperation is certainly not something inherent to corporations, that's for sure. Truly, there is no better endorsement of Vosh than a protest against Vosh. If you are a fan of Ian and you feel like some of what I've said here is a little bit too harsh or in bad faith, you're sort of proving my point. I'm not really that interested. I've heard that excuse far too many times now for me to bother taking it seriously. Not every belief is gained through gentle pushing, I'm afraid to say. A lot of my beliefs that I hold today had to, to some extent, be thrust upon me. It made me very uncomfortable at first. I, I didn't like it. I wanted to fight back. I felt like jumping out. But eventually, I came around to them. I had a great big moan about it, and I moved on. And I'm better for having known them. If by any chance you have felt this video made you question a few things, I highly advise you actually take some interest in some of this stuff. It's bad enough that as a white guy, more people are going to listen to me and take me seriously than if I wasn't. I do not want to be emulating that same dynamic of which I am criticizing. I only know what I do because I've bothered reading up on it and listening to the conversations of people who are a lot more knowledgeable than me, and piecing it all together, making actual analysis of each individual situation instead of just following along some vile dogma. Well, so should you. The conversations and discussions that we are currently having are a lot more complex than some BuzzFeed article. And in case you were wondering, I have no intentions of debating Ian. What a lot of you need to understand is that this modern obsession with debate doesn't really mean that much. It doesn't prove anything, and it favours the more ruthless and showmany person. 
that which I am not. And you go around carrying that debate bro attitude into your later life. Believe me, as a person who has had personal experience about this over my adult life, it does not pan out too well. In three or four years, you'll all be looking back at how cringe you were. Ian has clearly showcased in his time here that he's interested in one thing and one thing only. His ego. And only time is going to reveal that. If the American pretensions were based on more solid, a more honest assessment of life and of themselves, it would not mean for Negroes, when someone says urban renewal, that Negroes are simply going to be thrown out into the streets, which is what it does mean now. This is not an act of God. We're dealing with a society made and ruled by men. If the American Negro had not been present in America, I am convinced that the history of the American labor movement would be much more edifying than it is. It is a terrible thing for an entire people to surrender to the notion that one-ninth of its population is beneath them. And until that moment, until the moment comes, <coughs> when we, the Americans, we, the American people, are able to accept the fact that I have to accept, for example, that my ancestors are both white and black, that on that continent we are trying to forge a new identity for which we need each other, and that I am not a ward of America. I am not an object of missionary charity. I am one of the people who built the country. Until this moment, there is scarcely any hope for the American dream, because the people who are denied participation in it, by their very presence, will wreck it. And if that happens, it's a very grave moment for the West. Thank you. <laughs>